Hello, everybody, and welcome to Damascus, which is where I'm standing right now, reporting uh, from Syria. My name is Fred Pleitkin, and I'm the CNN correspondent, and I've been here, um, I think this is my 20th trip to Syria, and of course, this is a very, very important one, because it comes at a very volatile and difficult time here uh, for this country. We have uh, some pretty big events that have been going on over the past couple of days. You've had a major Syrian government offensive uh, in the east of the capital, Damascus, which is essentially won back for the government and their Russian backers, pretty much all of that territory. And then you have um, an alleged chemical weapons attack uh, that took place on the uh, 7th uh, of April. Uh, it took place in the evening hours. It was about, I would say, about 20 past 8 uh, that this allegedly happened. We were reporting on it when it did happen. It was only about, I'd say about eight miles from where I'm standing right now. And the facts around it are still quite murky. Essentially, uh, the opposition, which was in control of that area at the time, claims that a Syrian government helicopter uh, dropped canisters, and that after these canisters were dropped, that a toxic gas was released. People had trouble breathing. Dozens of people were killed, uh, they say. And of course, uh, we've seen some horrifying images uh, coming from that place with children having trouble to breathe, getting doused in water, uh, doctors trying to help them. It's been very difficult to watch. The Syrian government, for its part, denies any of these allegations. They came out very quickly uh, with a statement of their own, saying that, yes, they had been conducting an offensive in that area at the time, but they said that offensive was moving so quickly uh, that they did not need any sort of chemicals to move forward. And they also said that there were still thousands of pro-government prisoners in the hands of the opposition group called Jaysh al-Islam, which at the time controlled that area, and that therefore the Syrian government would not have wanted to endanger those people uh, as well. So as you can see, you have allegations, counter-allegations. One of the things that always uh, it makes it very difficult for us here is that, of course, the folks who are bearing the brunt uh, of the fighting that's been going on here uh, since the past seven years have been the civilians. And if you look at some of the images that have been coming out of eastern Ghouta, of that Duma region where this happened, or the Duma district, uh, where that happened, um, it, it certainly is very difficult to watch and to uh, report about. So um, right now we have those allegations, counter allegations, and then we're going to wait and see, or we have to wait and see right now, how the international community is going to react to this. The U.S. have already said that there's going to be, as they say, a big price to pay. Donald Trump coming out with some very strong words. Uh, the Russians are saying that that would be a bad idea. They say that it could have grave consequences. They are, of course, uh, the most important and strongest foreign power here on the ground in Syria. So what you have right now is you have a terrible situation here inside Syria uh, with, of course, this war still going on with these recent events. And then this is also turning into, I wouldn't say a powder keg, but very difficult situation internationally as well with all the countries that are involved here really getting into more and more of a conflict, which, uh, which is quite troubling considering especially that nuclear powers like the United States and, and Russia are involved. So we have our first question on this issue, uh, and uh, we have it from Chris. Thank you, Chris. He is saying, why is it every time the U.S. Uh, is about to withdraw, there is a chemical attack? I don't, uh, I, I basically can't answer that, uh, that question, but um, I'm not sure that this has anything to do with the U.S. announcing that it's going to withdraw. I mean, we have to keep in mind that this area here of Damascus, um, they've had some heavy fighting for the past month. So. The eastern outskirts of Damascus is a region called Eastern Ghouta. Some of it is quite rural, some of it is pretty suburban. And it's been in the control of rebels for about six years. But about a month ago, the Syrian government launched a fierce offensive to try and win back the rest of that, or try to win back all of that territory. They made sweeping gains. And this one area called Duma was pretty much the only one that was still left in the hands of the rebels, and they were about to lose that as well. It is true that the rebels were very, very close to losing and also were already negotiating their exit at the time that this alleged attack happened. So whether or not this has anything to do with the United States, whether something else was behind it, it really is absolutely uh, unclear. But the U.S., you're right, is saying that it does want to move out of Syria. But as far as I know, uh, the president had agreed that there would not be a timeline on that either, even, even though he said that he wanted that to be very, very soon. So Lori, thank you for your question, Lori, asks, uh, how can we help the people there? Um, it's interesting because there are uh, international aid organizations that are functioning on the ground here in Syria. The UN is here. The International Red Cross is here. The Syrian Arab Red Crescent uh, is here as well. Um, all those organizations are trying to help. If you look at the situation, though, uh, in that Duma 
uh, town outside of Damascus right now, um, it's sort of a swap that's going on. The rebels that are there, called Jaysh al-Islam, um, which is an Islamist group, have essentially given up. They're being bussed to the north of Syria, and then by and by, uh, the Russians are going to take over security for that area, and then the local Syrian administration is going to move in there as well. What amount of aid the Russians are going to allow in is anybody's guess at this point in time. They have allowed aid into some places, and there certainly are international organizations that are functioning here on the ground. So those would be the ones that could potentially get aid to the folks there in Douma, and they certainly are doing a very, very tough job here in Syria in general in many parts of the country. The next question is, if the U.S. were to strike, would they be at war with Russia? I would hope not. Um, that's one of the real situations right now. Look, you have the Russians saying that if the U.S. strikes and if Russian soldiers, for instance, are hit, that could have extremely grave consequences. And it's one of the things that has been the fear of many people in the international community uh, has been that there was an understanding between the United States and Russia who were both trying to fight against ISIS that here in Syria they would stay out of each other's ways on the ground and in the skies. That agreement, by and large, has worked, but as ISIS is getting squeezed out, it seems as though that agreement might be falling apart and that could have very dangerous consequences. War is a very strong word, especially when you're talking about the two, at least military, biggest superpowers in the world, but certainly there could be some pretty grave conflict. And I do think that right now it is a very volatile and dangerous situation here in this country. And I think everybody needs to be mindful of that uh, when we speak uh, publicly uh, in various forums or in the media about what is going on here right now. And just be very, very mindful of the fact that it is a very dangerous situation, I think, uh, that is currently unfolding here. Uh, the next question is, in Damascus where you are, is it safe? Um, I would say right now that it is in most places. Uh, there was some very heavy fighting going on here over the weekend uh, with uh, the Syrian government air force and Syrian military hitting some of those places in the outskirts, especially Douma. Um, some mass casualties there as well. And then there were rockets and mortars that were being fired back. Uh, there were, um, I think, at least 12 people who were killed on the Syrian government side uh, on uh, Friday and Saturday. So it was a pretty dangerous situation. Uh, it, was actually, it was actually Thursday and Friday, I'm sorry. So it was quite a dangerous situation. I was at a government hospital close to where I am right now, and they were taking a lot of casualties, a lot of wounded people as well. Right now, it does seem a lot more quiet. But it is quiet, though. Damascus is actually a fairly safe city. We walk around here day and night at any time, and it's also actually a very beautiful city if it ever opens to tourism again. Uh, it, is, it is actually a very, very, a, a city with an amazing history, if you ever get to, get to witness that. Um, Rick, thank you for your question, Rick, asks, um, where is the uh, International Criminal Court and the EU? Um, that's a very good question. I think right now it's very difficult for them to do anything. The, the European Union, they don't really have that much in the way of international military muscle. They obviously have diplomatic muscle, but they would be essentially working hand in hand with the Americans. If anything is going to happen here, it would be the Americans taking the charge simply because they have the most military muscle and they are the ones who could enforce anything that, was, that would be decided. The International Criminal Court could really only get involved if people were brought there and if people were prosecuted there. So um, if and when that will ever happen is, is really anybody's guess. But I don't see much of an involvement from the European Union except statements so far here as far as Syria is concerned. Uh, how long has the war been going on? Good question. The war has been going on since 2011. It started with uh, protests in the south of Syria and then uh, you know, spiraled out of control very, very quickly when there was a very heavy-handed response from the Syrian government. There were then people taking up arms, uh, people gaining or taking uh, whole districts uh, from uh, the Syrian military and the Syrian security forces, and then it sort of kept spiraling and getting worse and worse and worse. I would say that the, the probably worst point uh, as far as fighting was concerned was probably sometime in mid to late 2015. At that point in time, you had the largest expansion uh, of ISIS uh, in Syria, especially uh, in the east and northeast of the country. Um, you had a terrible situation in and around Aleppo, a terrible situation here uh, in Damascus. I, I remember standing where I am right now, and you can see behind me right now, uh, probably. It's actually fairly quiet right now, but it was, you could see plumes of smoke, explosion, 
you could hear gunfire pretty much 24-7. So it's quieted down a, a great deal. Also because, of course, you know, a lot of the fighting has already been done and many people here are just so tired of the war that they simply want it to end. I mean, people have really suffered a lot. And, and a lot of people are obviously also very psychologically traumatized by what's happened. And I think that's something that's going to be a big problem for this country uh, moving forward. Um, Tony, thank you very much, Tony, asks, how many Americans are currently in Syria? If you're talking about the American military, um, it's a personnel, we believe that the personnel strength is about 2,000. Uh, most of them are in the northeast of the country, although going down to the southeast as well to the area close to Deir ez -Zor, which is uh, where there was recently an incident as well, where apparently some pro-Russian irregular forces tried to move into a location and were then confronted by U.S. special forces who called in airstrikes and, um, and ended that uh, pretty quickly. But the U.S. does have about 2,000 personnel here. And it doesn't sound like much, but they do actually make a pretty big difference on the ground, especially to the forces who are fighting against ISIS. Uh, they act as what the Americans call a force multiplier and that they assist and advise, but they also are able to call in airstrikes uh, themselves. So they are quite an important force. They do play a pretty big role uh, here on the ground as a factor, especially uh, in regions, for instance, like the Hasaka region, but also in Raqqa as well, and then all the way to Manbij if you go further towards the northwest of the country. So their presence is somewhat controversial, of course, if you ask the other players here on the ground, but they certainly do play a pretty major role here in the greater scheme and the greater picture of things. Bella Donna, thank you for your question, asks, um, if we know, uh, ask if we know what kind of chemical attacks it was, we, we really don't. Um, it's one of those things that's also been mired in controversy, you know, and, and especially in the, in the early times, in the beginning minutes after something like this happens, you know, Twitter lights up with all sorts of people claiming all sorts of things. Um, experts and would-be experts coming up and saying people's symptoms indicate this and that. It's very, very difficult to tell. Uh, the two that seem to be prevalent right now is that some say that seem to have been a large dose of chlorine that might have been used, and there's some people who believe that a nerve agent, like for instance sarin, might have been used as well. But right now, and without any sort of forensics on the ground, it would be very, very difficult uh, to tell what exactly uh, is true, um, and when, or if we will ever find out with, with absolute certainty what was used, if something with you was used, how much was used, who used it. Um, I think it's going to be very, very difficult, to, uh, very difficult to find out and would potentially take uh, quite a long time. At the same time, of course, you have to keep in mind that you have a very difficult situation here on the ground. To even get forensic teams into that area would be a tall task and would not only require logistically uh, to do a lot, but also politically, of course, to make sure that those teams would have access. And then, um, just, uh, just, just to recap things, I mean, right now, I, I do think that we are probably in, in, I wouldn't say one of the most dangerous situations that I've seen here internationally in Syria, but, but certainly uh, it is one that is, is very, very volatile right now uh, and really pits two countries right now so that with the U.S. and Russia against, one of each, against each other diplomatically. We have you know, the situation between these two countries deteriorating anyway. Uh, for instance, after the case of that former Russian spy who was poison there in Britain and the U.S. holding Russia accountable. Now you have this alleged attack here. Um, you know, this is one of those places where you have the two militaries of these two very powerful countries operating very close to one another and right now very much at odds with one another. So keep an eye on that. We'll see if cooler heads prevail and how the international community wants to solve all of this. So I want to thank all of you for, uh, for watching. And, um, you know, it, it is... Um, I think it's really important for us to be on the ground here, to get all sides of everything, to see firsthand what is going on. And I think over the past couple of d days, once again, uh, we've seen just how important it is. And I, I, I hope that all of this uh, gets solved in a way that this does not spiral even more out of control than it already has. Thank you very much.